Good morning, guys and girls. For today, I wanted to talk to you guys about a pretty big idea that we just touch on during first year chem, which is equilibrium. Uh, but we've been talking about phase changes over the past four or five days. And phase changes, freezing and melting, sublimation, deposition, condensation, and evaporation, I refer to as a two-way street. Right? You're simply going back and forth between those two phases, and they occur at the same temperatures. Right? Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, but it also melts at that temp. And that's known as a chemical equilibrium. So what I wanted to do was give you guys a small dose of what equilibrium is, right, and then show you how we can affect those equilibriums. Right, so just a little background on equilibrium. When we're talking about equilibrium with phase changes or we're talking about it with reactions, we're talking about the principle that every reaction is able to occur in both directions. So sometimes we write reactions like this. Where if we wanted to look at the hydrogen re reacting with the oxygen, to form the water, you guys would look at that and you would say, I've got an element plus an element making a compound. Hey, that's a synthesis reaction. But when we were learning reaction types, I think a lot of you realized that if we reversed our synthesis and we said, well, we have water breaking down into H2 and O2, that it's a compound, no plus sign, breaking up into an element plus an element. That was one of our categories of decomps. And all I did was reverse these reactions. So sometimes that happens more readily than others. Like some reactions seemingly only occur in one direction. Other ones go back and forth far more easily. All right? And that's what this is telling you over here. It's saying that if we're looking at these reactions, we could get it to go forward as a synthesis, reverse as a decomp, but it might not be quite as easy. So they said, well, why would we write two separate equations? We will just give it this forward and backward arrow, which indicates a dynamic process, and they call it an equilibrium. We have touched on this idea throughout the chapters since then. Right? In stoichiometry, we talk about how much product you should get. Or as of yesterday, we talked about how much energy we should get or it should take to make a phase change occur. But in reality, we know that not every reaction we do leads to the maximum amount of product. Right? When we did our precipitation lab. We mixed the two things in the beaker. You guys filtered it. You guys dried it. Right? And you guys went ahead and masked it and found out, hey, the amount we got was not necessarily the same as what we predicted that we would get. Right? And some of the reasons for that is human error. Right? We talked about other reasons for that. And one of those reasons was the reversibility of reactions, that some of your product may have recombined to go back to reactants. And this is a big reason why not all reactions get a 100% yield because that reverse reaction may be kicking in and converting some of our product back into reactant. Right? So the idea of equilibrium reared its head when we were talking about stoichiometry. If we look at a more visual setup of one, if we take the gas, 
right, dinitrogen tetraoxide, and we let it decompose right, into nitrogen dioxide. Right? The one of them is a clear colorless gas that you see here on the left, and the nitrogen dioxide has kind of a burgundy color. So we have a visual check of where we are in this process. At the beginning, we have all reactant. So it's a clear colorless flask. But as the reaction proceeds, it tends to get darker and darker and darker as we are producing the NO2. And as we do that, eventually what happens is it stops getting darker we reach a certain level of darkness and the burgundy color stays constant. And they can measure that in a variety of fashions. The most common would be to measure how much light goes through it. But in general, just understand you level off. This is an equilibrium. Once we reach the point that it levels off, you have reached a set of circumstances where the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. And the reason it stops changing colors is that the species in the container are constant. Now, that doesn't mean the reaction stops. It just means there's no change in the amount of overall particles. So let's imagine that our NO, oh, I'm sorry, our N2O4 is this green particle. And let's imagine that the blue particle that I'm going to draw is the NO2. At the beginning, it's clear and colorless because we have all of that one type of particle. But as these guys begin to collide with each other and react, we start to get blue particles showing up. So what you'll find out is every time one of these greens breaks down, I get two of the blue particle. Right? So if these two greens collide, two of the greens will disappear. I'll get four of the purple. And I still have four of the N2O4s there. Right, now, two more of these could collide. And when two more of them collide, we get two of the reaction occurring again. So now I've got eight. of the purple, and I still have the two green left. And a lot of reactions don't proceed the whole way because if you look at this picture, eventually, and I separated them up, eventually what happens is it becomes more and more difficult for the two greens to find each other. And more likely what's gonna happen is two purples are gonna run into each other. So when we reach equilibrium, it's not that the reaction stops, it's what happens is that the moment two greens find each other, let's say those two greens do manage to collide, what will happen at the exact same moment is that two purples will collide and reform a green. So what will happen is, is the reaction is still going right on and on and on. But if we keep looking at pictures of it, we won't see any difference if we were looking at a picture. They're new particles, but the amount of those particles 
stays the same. And that's equilibrium. That every time one of these green guys turns into a purple, one of these purple guys turns into a green. And the easy everyday analogy that I give when we're doing this in class together is imagine Mrs. Sherry's room and my room, right, are easily connected by the hallway. The idea is that I have, say, 17 girls and 13 boys in my classroom, and she has a certain number. And when I send a girl from my room to her room, she sends a girl back from her room to my room. So the people that are in my room are changing. A reaction is occurring. Some of you are leaving. Some of you new people are coming in. But the types of molecules stay the same. I send two boys to Mrs. Sherry's room. She sends me two boys back, right? It's two different molecules, but they're of the same type. So they would visually look the same. So if you took a picture of my classroom 10 different times, I would see 30 different faces, right? Every time. I'd never see the same 30. But what I would see is 17 girls and 13 boys in every single picture, and her room ratio would stay the same. That's equilibrium, right? That the forward reaction happens at the same speed of the reverse reaction, and concentration stay constant because the number of particles aren't changing. All right, and that's what this is saying. I talked you through the collision theory molecules running into each other and why that happens, right? At the beginning of the reaction, there's no NO2, so the reverse reaction can't occur. But after time, the reverse reaction does occur. So the main idea that I introduced equilibrium for is to talk to you about Le Chatelier's principle. How is it that we can affect these reactions? And at the very beginning of the PowerPoint, there were scales of justice going back and forth, because an equilibrium is a balance, right? a balance between reactants and products. So the idea behind Le Chatelier's principle is if I affect one thing, the other side is going to compensate to make these balance out. Right? And that's Le Chatelier's principle. Right? The definition right, says that if we impose a change on a system, I, the equilibrium shifts to reduce that change. Right? The short and sweet answer of it is the equilibrium tries to undo what I've done. So if I add something, it tries to get rid of it. If I take something away, it tries to replace it. Right? And there's a couple ways that that can um, happen right? with Le Chatelier's principle. Right, we're going to focus on the easier ones, which are simply adding and taking some things away. Right, if you want to learn more, take me next year and you'll learn about pressures and all sorts of stuff. All right, so one of the easiest ways to affect an equilibrium is by adding a reactant or removing a reactant or adding a product or taking away a product. All right, so adding a reactant or a product shifts the equilibrium away from the increase. So if I add on the right, I shift left. Okay, now jot those down, and you guys can probably add those underneath on your own. So if I were to add on the right, you are going to shift left. You shift opposite of what you add. And same logic applies. If I add on the left side of an equation, it will shift opposite. So if I add on the left, it shifts to the right. right? And then things happen, right? If I'm shifting toward substances, they go up. If I shift away from them, those substances decrease. Right? The second thing says removing a reactant or a product shifts it towards whatever you do. So if I add on one side, I shift away from it. But if I take away on a side, 
we try to replace it. So if I remove on the right, we are going to shift left. And if I remove, I'm sorry, you shift toward what you do, shift right. And if I remove on the left, we will shift toward what we take away. I removed on the left, I will shift left. All right, so the first step in Le Chatelier's problems is figuring out what direction are you going to move to recreate the balance? And the easiest way is to do it with equations, all right? And I talk you through uh, one scenario first, and then we do some practice. All right, so if we want to maximize our product, we want to create as much stuff on the right of an equation as we can, which is what businesses want to do a lot of the times, so they're not wasteful. We want to create shifts to the right. And the two ways we can make something shift right is to add on the left, add reactants, and take away products, All right, And that's what this is saying. We flood the vessel with reactant, and then we take away product. Both of those things will be causing the equilibrium to shift toward the product side, making more and more and more and more product. All right, so one of the more popular ways to do it is known as the Haber process. All right, we take nitrogen gas, we take hydrogen gas, it's in equilibrium with ammonia. This is the most popular way we create the compound ammonia. It's a really popular uh, substance in cleaning products. It's a really popular substance in chemical fertilizers all right, that we use. So if I want to make this guy shift to the right, right, I can add on the left. So there are two things I could do to add on the left. I could add N2, add on the left, it shifts to the right. I could add H2 and it would shift to the right. So both of those things, I added on the left, it would shift it toward the right side, making more ammonia. The other thing I could do is take away NH3. If I remove on the right, it shifts to replace it. So remove on the right, shifts to the right. So I would create more NH3. So the equilibrium undoes what I do. So if I add H2 or N2, it wants to get rid of them. It shifts right. These guys start to go away after I add them. And I start to create NH3. All right, that's what would happen in that setup. All right, so here is a good way for us to make sure we understand this. If we look at this question, right, it says that in a study of chemistry of etching glass, right, an inorganic chemist looks at the reaction between sand, SiO2, and hydrogen fluoride at a temperature above the boiling point of water. And it wants to know what happens to the SIF4 when we do the following things. All right, so walking through these together. The first thing we have to do is figure out what direction the equilibrium will shift. So we would do that first. Once you figure out the direction the equilibrium shifts, then we can say what's going to happen to the amount of the SIF4. Right, so let's look at letter A. So A says I am removing H2O gas. Right, so I removed on the right because the H2O gas is over here. So if I remove on the right, our rule says you shift toward what you take away. So if I remove on the right, I am going to shift to the right. So I remove the H2O, it's on the right side, and we shift toward what we take away. And so there is letter A. In letter B, all right, we add some water, and it said it's a liquid, 
right? But we're above water's boiling point, which is the same as adding H2O gas. So this one, we added water and the H2O lives on the right. So this time we added on the right. The rule is we shift away from what we add, right? You shift toward what you take away. You shift away from what you add. So if I add on the right, I am going to shift left. We shift away from what we add so that we can eliminate it. In C, I'm removing HF. HF is over here. So I removed on the left. The rule is that we shift toward what we take away. So if I remove on the left, I will shift left because we shift toward what we remove and then lastly in letter d it says you take some sand away the sio2 right it lives on the left so i removed On the left, we shift toward what we take away, which means this will shift left. All right, so the take home message is see if you're adding or taking away. If you add a substance, shift opposite. If you take a substance away, shift toward it, right? So notice the three that removed A, C, and D, whatever they removed, we shifted toward that side. Remove right, shift right. Remove left, shift left. Remove left, shift left. And if we add something, we shift opposite. Add right, shift left, right? When you add, you flip to the opposite side. All right, so the last part of the question was, what's gonna happen to the SIF4? All right, and if I want to know what's going to happen to it, it depends on if the equilibrium is shifting towards it or away from it. All right, so if we go ahead and look at this, in A, we are shifting right, which means this equilibrium is shifting toward where SIF4 lives. So if I'm shifting at SIF4, I'm going to create more of it. So the SI F4 increases because I'm shifting toward the side it lives on. In B, C, and D, we are shifting left, which is not where SIF4 lives. So if we're shifting away from the SIF4, it's getting consumed. So in B, C and D, you are decreasing because we are shifting away from where the SIF4 lives, right? So if the SIF4 is on the right and we're shifting right, it goes up. If the SIF4 is on the right and we're shifting left, it's going to decrease. And we could do that for any of the substances, right? I could say what happens to the HF, right? And all you would say is, oh, in the first one, we're shifting right. The HF will decrease because it lives on the left. But in the other three, HF, it lives on the left. We're shifting toward it. It would increase in those ones. All right, so that's what's going on with your whole shifting if you add something or you take something away. All right, heat works the same way, and this is where our phase changes come into effect. All right, 
if we add or take away heat, the same holds true, right? Because heat can be thought of as a reactant or product, right? If we have an endothermic reaction or a phase change like melting, we put the heat on the reactant side. If we have an exothermic reaction or an exothermic phase change like freezing, heat is written on the product side, all right? And if we add heat or take away heat, it will shift accordingly, all right? So just to show you one more example like that, if we picked a phase change, like I said, let's look at melting. You've got the solid going to the liquid and we know that that's endothermic, that the heat lives as a reactant. So heat is just like any other substance, right? If I were to add heat in this setup, heat is on the left. If we add on the left, it causes a shift to the right. And no surprise, when I add heat to a piece of ice, it turns into water because we're shifting to the right in that process. All right, so just think of heat like any other reactant or any other product. If I were to take away heat, I were to put our ice into the freezer, right? Removing heat, remove on the left, causes a shift left. Some of my water that's in there is going to turn into ice as well. And in class, I uh, do a demo that really highlights this. And it's kind of cool, all right, where there is a reaction that is color-coded depending on the side that you live. All right, so here is a cobalt uh, ligand, all right, that has a bunch of waters attached to it. And we've got cobalt chloride ion, and these ions possess color, right? So I tell everybody in class that uh, delta H greater than zero means that heat lives on the left. So everybody in class would write plus heat right here. And then we talk about, well, what do you think will happen when the solution is hot, what do you think will happen when the solution is cold? All right, so what I'm going to do for you guys is highlight my equation, copy that, bring it over here. And then Seeing if I can move this guy. Okay. Well, at any rate, we said that we're going to put heat on the reactant side. Let's see if I can paste that one more time. And there we go. Drag it. So the first thing it says is it asks, what does this look like when it is hot? So if it's hot, we add heat. If we add heat, that lives on the left, we shift. to the right. And notice, because we're shifting right, which color ion lives on the right? It's the blue ion. All of a sudden, this guy changes colors from pink to blue, because we are shifting it toward the side that has the blue ion. If we looked at what this thing looks like cold, Right? You can't add cold. Adding cold is removing heat. 
and the heat is on the left. So we removed on the left. When we take something away, it shifts towards it. So that creates a shift left. And our pink ion lives on the left side. So this guy becomes more pink. Right. And I found a video of it that I want to play for you guys. Right. And I'll do the you know, voiceover for you guys. And what you're seeing here is the substance over here on the left side. Right? It is cold, so we're on the left side of our equilibrium. This COH2O6 ions dominating in here. And then this substance was on a hot plate. It's hot, which made it shift right. So the COCl4 dominates all right, on that side. And then the thing he brought up in the middle was the normal mixture. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to flip-flop those. We're going to put the hot one, the one that was blue, into the cold water. And we're going to put the cold one into a hot scenario. All right, so as this guy is cooling off, you can see it right here, the blue one, we're removing heat. It's making it shift left. Its color is changing because that equilibrium, when heat is being removed, is shifting away from it. So you're seeing this blue one get gradually and gradually more pink. Right? The pink one is adding heat on this hot plate. That's going to make it move to the right, making it become blue. Right? And it takes a little bit longer for the cold one to warm up than the warm one to cool down, right? But the thing that they're bringing out right now, this used to entirely look like this. And why is it purple at the bottom and the, I'm sorry, pink at the bottom and blue on top? Because heat rises, all right? So it cools it from bottom up because the heat keeps rising, but eventually that guy would turn entirely pink, right? We'd get it to shift to the right side. And then we bring in the other one. Right, that's the baseline one. And then here's the one that was on the hot plate. And you can see when you put it next to the original one, this guy is gradually getting that blue. And the longer I would leave it in there, the more blue it would become. And we'll fast forward to that so that you can see what it would look like closer to the end. And visually now you can start to see how much more blue uh, this one here has become. And that would be a demo uh, that I would do in class. All right, so no new homework today. I hope you guys uh, have better understanding about equilibrium in Le Chatelier's. Uh, in the parent square message that I'll send out to you guys, I will attach the PowerPoint as your notes, and feel free to look at that. Uh, other than that, I will be meeting with you guys tomorrow, and I hope everybody is having a good week.